The story of the people of the cave is very important. All of those stories in the Quran have a central position in our religion that I think set the stage for the ideas I want to share with you and the reflections I intend to share with you from these ayat and may Allah Azza wa bring benefit from them. Now, the first thing I'd like to share with you is that of course the Quran is full of stories. It has many of them. And in all of those stories, we'll find a common thread. And that is that Allah does not go into too much detail. That Allah Azza wa has compared to the same story, if you find it, the, the, the biblical version of the same story, you'll find a lot more pages covering the same story in the Bible. Or if the same exact historical accounts, a, a, a scholar writes about them. Like for example, if a scholar writes a book about Ibrahim alayhi salam, his book is going to be a lot longer than even if all of the ayat combined about Ibrahim alayhi salam are going to come out to a lot shorter. What I'm trying to say is Allah when He tells the stories, He's very brief. And that raises some questions, why is He so brief? As a matter of fact, even the longest story in the Qur'an, the one unified story in the Qur'an, the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, is also in fact brief. As long as it is, it's still brief. And there are lots and lots of details that just aren't mentioned. You know, as far as locations are mentioned, only Egypt is mentioned. Where he used to live isn't even mentioned. Yusuf alayhi salam's father is mentioned. His brother's names aren't even mentioned. His mother is not even, she doesn't even come up in the story. There's a minister. Ministers are pretty important people, you would think. We don't even know his name, not from the, not from the Qur'an. The Qur'an doesn't emphasize his name. So Allah Azza wa Jal chooses not to give us all the details. And the reason for that is whatever he chose to make part of the Qur'an, whatever he chose to include is of the most important value. Something that is not important enough to make it into the Qur'an does not make it into the Qur'an. So Allah Azza wa Jal himself teaches us by telling stories in a certain way, what is important and what is not important. That is Allah's way of prioritizing. So if you get obsessed and I get obsessed about what the name of the minister was or the king was at the time of Yusuf alayhi salam, well that is a detail Allah azza wa jal himself did not make important. There are other things that are far more important. If you and I start getting obsessed about what were the names of his brothers, what's the oldest guy's name, then what's number, you know, what's number two, what's number three, what's number four, all the way down, all the way down to twelve, what's the sequence? Well, Allah didn't make that a big deal, so we don't have to make that a big deal. Allah Himself prioritizes for us so we don't get sidetracked. Now, the story I want to share with you some things about is the story of the people of the cave. It, ha it's, it springboards from that event and that, that narrative that Allah describes in the beginning of Surah Al-Kahf. These young people, if you, wanna, if you don't know the whole thing, I'll just summarize it very briefly for you. These young people decided that they're going to accept, not only accept, but live up to their Islam in a society that hated Islam. And actually they could have stayed quiet and not told anyone that they're Muslims. And they could have lived dormant lives, undercover Muslims kind of thing. But Allah Azza wa Jal gave them the courage of heart that they stood up and they testified. إِذْ قَامُوا فَقَالُوا رَبُّنَا رَبُّ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فَمَا أَهَمِّيَةْ كَلِمَةْ قَامُوا why, why is the word Qamu even mentioned? They stood up, they rose, they stood up to challenge the king and the authorities that be and said, no, we don't accept the religion of, of the state or whatever else, of the governance. We have our own faith. We, we believe in the master of the skies and the earth. They declared it openly. And this was considered an act of treason. So they were supposed to be executed for their crime. And they were, these are young guys. These are young, young friends. So they got scared and they asked Allah for help and Allah put in their heart that they should go back into a cave, a cave that they were familiar with, but I won't tell you how they're familiar with that, that's for another time inshaAllah ta'ala. So they go into this cave into hiding and Allah you know, covers their ears, they go to sleep, and they don't even realize that 309 some years have passed by and they wake up. And then the story continues that they come out, they send one of them theirs to go get some food. Obviously he goes out to get food and he's wearing clothes from 300 years ago, fashion might have changed just a little bit and your, your currency might not exactly be the same. You know, if somebody spoke English from 300 years ago, you'd be like, is, is it Halloween already? What's going on, you know? It wouldn't fit in. So the guy goes to do some shopping and he's pulling out like 300 year old currency. So obviously he gets attention. He's trying to not get attention. Whoever goes among you should really watch his step. And don't let anybody realize that what's, up going, what's going on with you, but the guy, how's he gonna hide? If he's wearing 309 year old clothes and he's got ancient currency in his hands, obviously he's going to be the center of attention. So now people find out about what's going on and they get discovered. That's the gist of it. That's the gist of it. But then Allah decided, and I told you Allah, the, the stories in the Quran are brief. But Allah decided to dedicate a very long set of words 
to this discussion. And this discussion is سَيَقُولُونَ ثَلَاثَةٌ رَابِعُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ They say they were three. They say, or they will say rather, that they were three. And the fourth one was their dog. Their fourth was their dog. Because they had a dog that was at the mouth of the cave. That people would just see its paws and they'd run away. Okay, that Allah mentions this dog previously too. وَيَقُولُونَ خَمْسَةٌ سَادِسُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ And then they're also gonna say that there were five actually. There were five guys. And the sixth one was their dog. رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ And I'll tell you about رَجْمًا بِالْغَيْبِ in a bit. Throwing stones in the dark. Literally what that means is throwing stones in the dark. وَيَقُولُونَ سَبْعَةٌ وَثَامِنُهُمْ كَلْبُهُمْ And they'll also say there were seven and the eighth one was their dog. Now, Allah says they say this and they say this and they say this. So you would think this is important. But actually a lot of times, a lot of Muslims, Unfortunately, when they read this or study this story, they don't realize what's hap- happening here, what Allah Azza wa is saying. One thing we have to note in the Quran is whenever Allah Azza wa says, Yaquluna, they say, they say. Study the entire Quran, look for what they say. And you'll find they say really dumb things. They say idiotic things. They say things that Allah criticizes. They say things like, Yaquluna matahua. They say, when is the day of judgment coming? You know, they, they ask or they, they, they make all kinds of yaquluna sha'ir, they say he's a poet. That's what they say. In other words, when people just talk, Allah quotes their stupidity sometimes in the Quran and then answers it with wisdom. He answers it with wisdom. So even the uslub, just starting with sayaquluna, should give an ishara, should give a hint to the reader Allah is not happy with these people. They're not, he's not exactly happy with these people. Now this story has many amazing lessons. But before I go into them and appreciate, help myself and you appreciate the wisdom of these ayat, I want to give you another story on the side. This one I made up myself. Imagine that I am a business teacher. My job is to teach students how to start a business. How do you start a business? So I, and a lot of times, of course, as a good teacher, you should use stories to teach lessons. Because students remember the story, they can relate to it, they can draw lessons from it, right? Allah Himself does that in Qur'an. So I decide to tell my students a story about a guy who started a business. So this guy, first he looked at the best real estate, he wanted to open up a store, so he found out which area has the most foot traffic, so people will walk into his store. Then he got a good price, he negotiated it really well, and he got the store. Then he looked at what product is in most in demand, and he got made sure he went and purchased that kind of product. Then he went and found out what are the best suppliers, so he can get the best prices for his product. Then he found out what is the best prices, reasonable prices at which he can sell to his customers. Then he learned how to deal with customers in a patient way, way and be nice to them so when the customers come into the store they like how he he treated them so they recommend others to his store also and I'm telling them the story about this guy who opened his store and does all these things so his successful business could be successful and he benefited event tremendously by following these few principles and you know not making sure he filed his taxes properly this and that and the other and a student raises his hand he just listens to the whole story he's taking notes he raises his hand and he says what color jacket does he wear to work Another guy asks, well, what, what, how did he paint the door? How did he paint the door? And you know, what kind of cash register did he get? Did he get the, you know, the digital one or the manual one? What did he get? So these guys, these students start asking questions. And you know what that tells you when they ask those kinds of questions? I don't think you realize the point I was making when I was telling you the story. The point of it was, you should learn to take these principles and start a successful business yourself. The color of your jacket will not help you. you Does he wear shoelaces shoes or does he put Velcro on his shoes? What does he do? It won't help you. It's irrelevant. It's actually, it's a kind of what they say in Arabic, نَوْعٌ مِنْ سُوءِ الْفَهَمْ You didn't understand the point. Allah Azza wa Jal dedicated several ayat telling us that these young people were amazing. He told that they were, they were young people. I mean, this is a college town. Young people, young guys, young guys get together and do what? Dhikr of Allah. They get together and make dua to Allah. They get together and help each other stay away from haram things. Is that usual or unusual? The guys here sitting can tell you. When a bunch of guys get together collectively, they don't get smarter, they get dumber. They do stupid things when they get together. And these young people, they are each other's strength. They in a society filled with fitna are, are protecting each other's deen. And young people living in a society that has no values can do anything they want. 
they could party, they could, I mean, don't think that partying only got invented when, you know, in the modern world, there's ancient forms of partying too. All the things you enjoy and all the forms of entertainment and, you know, the distraction in life you have, move up people. For someone in the back is giving me the indication to move you up. So young people are gonna do bad things, especially when they get together. But these guys are pretty amazing. They get together and they protect each other from getting assimilated into losing all of their values. And they're pretty independent also. There's no parent over them telling them, you shouldn't do this, this is haram, this isn't right. A lot of you young people, your parents tell you, don't do that, don't watch this, don't go there, it's haram. And you're like, oh God, everything's haram. These guys don't even have parents telling them what to do. They have total freedom. As a matter of fact, the entire society is free and encourages them to be rebellious against Allah. And they say, no, we're not going to. These are pretty amazing people. And then they turn and make dua to Allah. وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا Brother comes up to me and says, Brother, I go to campus. And there's girls everywhere, man. I don't know what to do, bro. I got a lot of fitna. I can't help myself. You know? Is there some exception for me? You know, because you can't blame me. I'm just surrounded by shaitan everywhere. So, you know, sometimes I fall, you know. It's, it's not that bad. And I say, man, these young people were surrounded by fitna too. But they learned to understand that you, yourself, I, myself are helpless. Yes, we are helpless. We can help ourselves. But Allah is the one who provides protection. Allah is the one who protect, provides guidance. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا مِن لَدُنْكَ رَحْمَةً وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا رَشَدًا That's the dua young people are learning to make from this amazing story. And then Allah will protect you in a way you can't even imagine. He'll take you into, He took them into a cave, and these are not prophets. These are not, this is not a miracle of prophets. These are regular Muslims. These are regular Muslim young guys. And Allah can put them to sleep for 300 years so they can stay away from fitna. Allah can do that for them. And Allah can not, and keep them alive. You're already learning Allah controls life and death, and Allah can save you in ways you can't even imagine. This is our iman. This is the power, when we say, Allah is capable of all things, then that's what we're saying, that Allah can do anything. He can even do that with these young people, why can't He help me? If His help can come in such miraculous ways, not even just for prophets, these are regular Muslims, then His help can come to me, I should not ever lose hope that the help of Allah is near. And the way in which it will come, I can't even imagine. They didn't know, they woke up, and they're like, يَتَسَأَلُوا بَيْنَهُمْ إِذْ يَتَسَأَلُونَ بَيْنَهُمْ they're asking each other, hey, how long were we knocked out? One guy goes, I think we were out the whole day. And the other one's like, maybe a little bit in the afternoon. And the other one says, Rabbukum a'lamu bima labithum. Your master knows better how long you've been there. Now that's enough for my point. Some people listen to this amazing story and the only question that they raise their hand with and say, were they three or four? Were they five or six? Were they seven or eight? This, whether three or four or five or six or eighteen or twenty-five, how do you benefit from that? What color of the jacket? <laughs> Allah is so angry at these people that Allah gave them this amazing lesson. And the only argument you find in them is this. What is wrong with you people? And then Allah in His anger also, subhanahu wa ta'ala, described this practice with a phrase. He says, Rajman bil ghayb. Rajman bil ghayb. This is part of what you call in the Quran at Taswir al Fanni, artistic depiction. Quran draws images. So you can imagine things, so you can learn lessons. Allah says, These people who talk like this, they are like people standing in the dark with a bunch of rocks in their hand, and a guy's trying to hit a target, and he's just kind of throwing stones in every direction. That's called Rajman bil ghayb. Okay? In, in darkness, he's just throwing stones in every direction. Now there's something wrong with a, a guy who does that. Imagine some guy in a parking lot, he's got a bunch of rocks in his hand, no lights are on, and he's got a bunch of rocks, he's just chucking them in every direction. He's got a target somewhere, he wants to hit this bottle. Obviously he don't, doesn't know where it is. Now what is wrong with that practice? First of all, it seems like a type of insanity. Second of all, obviously you will probably hurt someone else when you do this. You will hurt someone else when you start making wild guesses. And even if you hit your target, you won't even know. Even if you figured out it's seven, and it's not eight, and it's six, and it's not seven, or it's three, and it's not four, so what? What do you get out of that? Allah Azza wa responds Himself. Now Allah could have ended the mystery. Were they three or four? Five or six? Seven or eight? Allah Himself could have said, قُلْ سَبْعَ 
انتهى الامر he could have said there were seven okay done end of discussion he didn't do that he says قُلْ رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِعِدَّتِهِمْ الامر هنا قُلْ tell them let them know the way to continue this discussion number one our ma- my master knows better how much they were how many they were he chooses not to tell us he chooses not to tell us he chooses to tell us the thing you should know is Allah knows their number that is not your business you don't have enough lessons to learn that you got caught up in this people do this with all the stories of the prophets if you're one of those people make tawbah that you hear the stories of the prophets and you're like hey so Yusuf alayhi salam after all those years he came out of prison did he marry that woman or what what do you I don't care Quran didn't go into that question. So why do you even want to ask the question and why do you seek the answer? What will you get out of that? What will you benefit from it? There are some who ask, what, was, what kind of dog was it? What was the dog's name? You know, what is his, his name is Bowser or Rufus? What? I don't care. That doesn't help you. That is not the point of the story. Then people do this and another way people do this, it's not just limited to stories. There are ahkam of this deen, there are rulings, regulations, principles. Guidelines, things you must do as a Muslim, things you should not do as a Muslim. There are regulations on all of us. And you should know them. You should know what you can eat, what you can't eat. You should know how to purify yourself and how you shouldn't purify yourself. You should know the kind of interaction you can have with the opposite gender and the kind of interaction you can't have. You should know your limits. But you know what people do? Some people, the only kinds of questions they ask about Islam are the questions that have nothing to do with their life. They, have not, they, they will not benefit from the answer But it's a question about Islam No doubt about it Hey, so what if you live on the North Pole? How do you make five prayers? Because the sun's up for six months How do you pray? Do you live on the North Pole? Are you moving? Did you get a job at the North Pole? Have you already rented one of those, you know, icicle things? Is that set? So you should ask that question when it's relevant to you Why are you asking now? What is it, how does it help you? See, fuqaha can ask those questions because they have to answer all kinds of people. But you and me as an average Muslim, we have to ask the questions that benefit us. If they don't benefit us, then don't ask the question. This is kathratul su'al. And this is taking you away from the, what the religion really is. In the few minutes I have left with you, I want to share some more lessons from these ayat because the, the lesson Allah has to teach is not done. But one other thing that the Prophet ﷺ told us, ad Nasiha. He summarized the entire religion. Or some, you know, the Prophet says that he was given Jawami al Kalim. Utit Jawami al Kalim. He was given the, the most comprehensive words, few words that capture everything. You can have hundreds and thousands of books on Islam, and then you can have two words and it says everything. Ad-Dinu Nasiha. It's the Rasul's word, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Religion is sincere counsel. The entire religion, all it amounts to is ultimately sincere counsel. Counsel. What does that mean? That everything in our religion that I learn and everything in my religion that I try to teach should have the benefit of helping someone, counseling someone. Either it makes them stronger in their faith or it betters their practice. That's it. There are only two things. Either it makes your iman stronger or it makes your amal stronger. And that's it. That's nasiha. If you are curious about something and it neither benefits your iman, and it, nor does it benefit your amal, then you're outside of a deen on nasiha. Then you are interested in questions that are related with the deen, but they have no nasiha in them. You see what the Prophet did with these words, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is he caged our curiosity to that which is beneficial. Because people have curiosities of all kinds of things, in Islam and outside of Islam, and many of them are not beneficial. So our curiosity, you're right, you have a right to be curious, but be curi- about, curious about things that will help you. Not just useless things, just random things that you're curious about. So now let's come back to this story. Allah Azza wa Jal says, قُلْ رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِعِدَّتِهِمْ My master knows better what their number is, which basically means you be quiet. Don't even ask that question. Who are you to say they're three or four or five? حِينَمَا قَالْ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَلَى رَبِّي أَعْلَمْ مَنْ يَقُولْ أَنَا أَعْرِفْ أَنَا أَعْلَمْ If Allah has already said, I know, I know better. Who's going to come out and say, actually, I think I know how many there were. (laughs) It's done. That discussion is over. قُلْ رَبِّي أَعْلَمُ بِعِدَّتِهِمْ Then he doesn't say, this is the دِقَّةُ الْإِسْتِعْمَالِ فِي الْقُرْآنِ He doesn't say, مَا يَعْلَمُهَا إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ 
He said, hum illa qaleel. You see, when he, if he said, yeah, ma ya'lamuha illa qaleel, the ayah would have meant, nobody knows their number except a few. Nobody knows the number except a few. But in the ayah, Allah does not say, He's not even talking about the number anymore. He says, nobody knows the reality of them except a few. No, nobody pays attention to what I really told you the story for except a few. Most people get caught up in these things. Most people get caught up in distractions. And they'll forget the point for which I'm telling you the story, for, for which Allah is teaching. ما يعلموهم إلا قليل these, the, these young people of the cave, I can't even imagine how many, I can't remember how many different khutbahs I've given, different topics on just the people of the cave. On just them. Because they are such an inspiration in the Qur'an. Especially for young people living in times of fitna. They are such an inspiration. And Allah Azza wa says, most people don't realize what they really are. Except very few. Most people, don't move, you just think it's just a story. It's not, a, it's guidance from Allah. Allah decided to make these, crystallize these people's lives in history through His book because people until the day of judgment will get advice from these young people. These young men will be role models for other young men until the day of judgment because Allah made them part of His book. مَا يَعْلَمُهُمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ Then He says, فَلَا تُمَارِي فِيهِمْ يعني لَا تُجَادِلْ فِيهِمْ The word, Mara yumari, mira, and this this word in the Arabic language actually comes from marwun. Marwun means a hot rock, a rock that is hot on the inside, like burning on the inside. You can't see the fire of it until you touch it. But also mar from from it mara. They say mara shata, yani istakhraja labnahu. That he, if, if somebody has, Lisan al Arab mentions this when you when you milk a goat, that's called mara also. Mara or miria also al jadal wa shak. The, the miriya, the word miriya means actually argumentation and doubt. Now, la tumari fihim means don't engage in an argument about them. Don't use evidences against each other about them. Don't pull out interesting facts like milking a goat. Don't pull, pull out interesting facts about them. Just to have curious conversation for no purpose. Illa mira'an zahiran. Except you should have an engaging conversation about them and pull evidences from what, what Allah told you about them in what is obvious. Mira'an, zahiran. Yani ma, min ma huwa zahir. Min kitabillah. Whatever you needed to know about the people of the cave, whatever advice you could have gotten from these people, Allah put it in the Quran. That is zahir. That He made obvious. Whatever could not have helped you, He made ghaib. He didn't tell you. That is the way Allah teaches. Illa mira an zahiran. Now this is not, we are not the people who knew about the people of the cave first. It is narrated that some Jews came to the Prophet ﷺ and some other you know, narrations, Christians even, came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, who are the people of the cave? Manashabul kahf. Who are these people of the cave? If you're really a prophet, you would know. So Allah revealed to him, you know, am hasibda anna ashab al kahfi wal raqeem kanu min ayatina ajaban. The ayat began about the people of the cave. In other words, we're not the only ones who have been educated about their story. The people of the book also knew about them, yes? And obviously I told you, Allah speaks to us briefly. But if you look at the books of the Christians and the Jews, there are extensive amounts of detail. Extensive amounts of detail. So probably the same story is going to be five times as long. So they would have a lot more information that we do. What did Allah tell us? فَلَا تُمَارِ فِيهِمْ إِلَّا مِرَاءً ظَاهِرًا وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِي فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا Don't go seeking more information or verdicts about these young people from any of them. What is Allah telling us? They may know that there were some people in a cave, but they have no guidance from that story. The guidance is in Qur'an. You will get nothing from the people of the book in, from this story that you don't already have in Allah's book. There is no reason to go to them and even ask the question. وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِي فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا this is a very important teaching of our book. We have something in common with the people of the book. They know about Nuh alayhi salam, we know about Nuh alayhi salam. They know about Ibrahim alayhi salam, we know about Ibrahim alayhi salam. They know about Adam alayhi salam, we know about Adam alayhi salam. But what we know gives guidance and what they know they have corrupted. They've corrupted it. So it's, I'm telling you, if you read what they say about Ibrahim alayhi salam, you will think it's talking about another person. Not the Ibrahim alayhi salam that Allah told you about in Quran and that the Prophet told you about in his sunnah. It's a different person. You can't even compare. Like, are you, is this the same Abraham? Is this, this is what you say about him? 
Allah Azza wa Jalla says there's no reason to go to them for fatwa. لا تستفتي فيهم منهم أحدا On these things Because whatever lessons you had to learn From these great figures of history Allah Azza wa Jal perfected those lessons Perfected them So they are permanently relevant Until the day of judgment In the Quran This is the superiority of Quran They may have original knowledge of the story But the perfect knowledge of the story And the most beneficial knowledge of the story The story that will have nasiha for you and me And for all of mankind That is going to be Allah's book وَلَا تَسْتَفْتِ فِيهِمْ مِنْهُمْ أَحَدًا Subhanallah We're supposed to bring an attitude to Allah's book To the stories of the prophets To everything we learn in Islam We're not just learning it to full of curiosity We're learning it so it makes us better in something It strengthens our iman It builds our understanding It makes us better practicing some, In some way it made us a better Muslim It strengthened our heart or it strengthened our action May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a people who internalize ad deen nasiha May Allah Azza wa Jal help us learn the teachings of the Quran In a way that better our faith and better our practice May Allah Azza wa Jal help instill a love for this book and the sunnah of his messenger alayhi salatu was salam into our own hearts and into the hearts of our families barakallahu li wa lakum fil quran al hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyyakum bil ayat wa dhikr al hakim